Up next, we take a look at Sanctum from Czech Edition Ga Games Editions, a board game that attempts to recreate the demon-killing, loot-collecting feel of video games like Diablo. We need to thank CGE for providing us with a review copy of Sanctum. We need to change that intro. I did it for the last episode. I forgot about it last time because if we record these for YouTube, thank you for watching. Hit that subscribe and the bell button. Uh, we should be saying, like, tonight we're talking about, but we'll yeah. fix that next time. Uh, Sanctum was designed by Philippe Neduc and features artwork from Usi Kus, OJ Herdena, Jakob Politzer, Frangishek Sedlichuk, and it was released in Gen Con 2019 by Czech Games Edition. We did our best with those pronunciations. Apologies yes. if any of them didn't quite come out right. Those are some uh, very non-English names. Yeah, they were all in Czech and um, with lots of accents on them and, and yeah. way, way too, uh, not way too many vowels when I look at them, but lots, lots of interesting ones. So yeah. I do apologize if I pronounce those long. I tried to, to do the best I could. Far more accents than we're used to in, our, in the English yes. language. Well, to see with your own eyes what you get with this board game version of Diablo with the numbers filed off, be <laughs> sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. For a full list of components, you can also check out the blog version of this review. Uh, for this podcast, though, I'm just going to highlight a few things that stood out. First off, I do have to call it the miniatures in this game. These are amazingly detailed in great dynamic poses. That's something I love seeing on modern miniatures. Or it's just not people in these like flat poses. These are actually better than some of the miniatures I've seen in miniature war games. And to be honest, they don't need to be in this box at all. Like They're just there to look pretty. You could have just been moving people and meeple, and it still would have worked. Yeah, it's definitely cool that they stepped up and went to that next level with the mini uh, minis, even though they could have easily just used little wood bit, little wood bits. Now, next, I want to call to attention the awesome artwork. Like overall, it's great and it's really cool. The characters look nice. It's a fairy themed game, but I was really impressed in this because there are a ton of cards, and on every card is a piece of equipment, and everyone has a unique piece of art. So I bet some of it doesn't change much. It's like the feather on the hat change, but still, it's a great touch that every single piece is unique because this is a game about collecting equipment. And I also want to call out the design, just the iconography, the color coding, how easy to see everything is from across the board, which actually enhances the gameplay. Yeah, it's not just a sword is a sword is a sword is a sword. Now, everything, everything else is great. Uh, thick cardboard, easy to use player boards, nice clear plastic uh, tokens in red and blue for tracking stamina and focus. A really nice, actually. Nice, clear um, red and blue. Uh, gems that you're going to collect during the game are square and opaque, so they actually stand out from the other ones. And again, they're nice plastic. The game even comes with a plastic tray for protecting the miniatures and some of the other components. So not really an insert, but a helper. Yeah, just a little extra box. Like most of the rest of the game's boards. So you put all the boards in, then just toss this tray on top. So so the components are great. What is the game all about? All right. So the overall thing of theme of Sanctum is basically the plot of the Diablo series of games that this is obviously inspired by. You start off in a village and you go out and kill wave after wave of demons attempting to improve your gear, learn new skills in order to breach the walls of Sanctum and fight the demon lord. Every monster you kill lets you advance your skills, and every kill also gives you a new piece of equipment. Now, while this sounds like it could be cooperative, it is not. The winner in this game is the player who manages to survive with the most life, or the player who manages to do the most damage to the Demon Lord if no one surprise, survives. So a very Euro multiplayer solitaire with big scary demons. So how is Sanctum played? All right, this is a this is a heavier one from Check Games Edition. It's what you'd expect from them. So this is going to be a bit of a more of an overview than our usual uh, walkthrough on how to play. But this will give you the general idea. So there's four different characters that are all very different from each other. Everyone's got a unique set of nine skills where not even a single one of those overlap that can be unlocked during play. The two main resources of the game are stamina and focus, and you're going to start with a varying amount of those. These are represented by red and blue pools on the character board and totally going to remind the Diablo players of your health and mana. To start with two gold D6s, you're going to place a third one that they can earn later because this is a dice rolling game. Yeah, so specifically Diablo 2 is where the inspiration really seems to sort of uh, line up most uh, mostly in uh, this game. Now, once player orders determined, characters get some starting stuff. 
uh, either potions or the ability to level up some skills, depending on how far they are from first player. Uh, I thought a neat mechanic in this is the potions are two-sided, so you've got your, your red stamina side and your blue focus, and you flip it like a coin to see what you start with. I thought that was neat. No, people aren't always fans of randoms, but that's a nice, cute little uh, way, way to use randomness in your game. Yeah, I liked it. Now, the game does come with six two-sided game boards, and the number used is based on the number of players, using all six with four and cutting it down as you have less. You lay your first two boards out, you shuffle all the cards, cards, you put them in their proper place, and you're ready to play. Now, each turn, players are going to pick between three things, move, fight, or rest. Now, at the start of the game, you're going to have to move because there's nothing to fight yet. Uh, and then... Once you've got something to fight, you can fight, but there's no reason to rest because you haven't actually fought anything yet. So it's kind of neat that there's this little progression. And what I love about this as a game teacher is that it's good for just starting play because all I need to teach you is how to move. Okay, now that you've moved and have monsters you can fight, now I can teach you how to fight. Now you fought some monsters, I can teach you how to rest. I like that I don't have to front load all of that. Right, and we've we've discussed a lot recently how ramping up is just that fantastic way to really help games be more beginner-friendly. Mm-hmm. now moving really simple move your character to the front of the line the board's just a bunch of circles in a progression line there's no choices you just move to the front of the line if you're already in the front you move up one spot then you spawn monsters these come from decks of hobbit sized cards they come in three levels one two and three there are also three colors of monsters red blue and green and each monster also has a type of loot that it'll drop and that's also shown on the card you're going to put these out in pairs or single monsters depending on what it says on the board then after laying them out you're going to pick one to confront and you're going to pick either a group of uh, like a pair if there's a pair or a single monster and you put it on your player board now note this you get to pick what you're fighting this is a, the, one of the first indicators of how much of a euro this game is because this is a tough choice because you have to take into account the monster level the number of monsters you're taking what dice they need based on the equipment you have what color they are because the color they are affects which skills you're going to get to level up and well then which items they might drop because that matters too now in addition to this at the end of each board is a treasure chest. And this is like a little bonus thing. And it's a reward for the first player to get the end of the board. You take all the monsters that are on the board already and flip the word to the treasure side and everyone gets to pick one. But it's in the order that players are on the board. So it's kind of important to keep progressing instead of just staying back and fighting all the time. You kind of want to get further ahead so you don't lose out on the good loot. Um, finally, there are a couple spots twice throughout the game. You're going to unlock more dice. I'm not going to bother getting into the details of how or where, but just know that as the game goes on, you earn more dice. And more dice means more pips to use against the monsters you're fighting. Yeah, exactly. Now, fighting has you battle the monsters you've already drafted. So, of course, you can't fight until you've drafted some. Now, each monster is going to show one, two, or three dice on their cards, depending on what level they are. And they also show a number of blood drops at the bottom, and that's the damage they'll do if they're not defeated. It's really simple here. You roll your dice and match the numbers on the monster cards. If the dice match, you killed the monster. Now, if the dice don't match, this is where your equipment comes into play. You can then use your equipment to uh, modify the die rolls. You have seven different equipment slots, five which start with basic equipment. The rest you have to fill with stuff you kill from monsters. And each spot on the equipment board will let you spend stuff from your stamina pool or your focus pool for some benefit. And those are usually modifiers to the die rolls, whether it's adding or subtracting pips. Each character also has a rage ability. This lets you set one die to a side. It's very powerful, but the only way to get your rage back is to fight a fight where you can't use all your dice. So your character's in rage because they couldn't kill all the monsters. Right. So while in essence, the game is do damage, get stuff, do more damage, repeat. There's so much more to it that because of these choices, which mm -hmm. may not even be obvious uh, when you when you're just looking at this monster bashing game, but take what is a simple concept and evolve it into so much more. Yeah. And what would really impress me about that is basically you're playing Roll For It or King of the Dice, but then there's so much more to it with all the equipment being able to modify your dice. Now, if there's monsters left, so you've spent all your dice, because you only start with two dice, and if you've picked up three monsters, you're not going to be able to kill them all, you take damage. And what you're going to do is look at all the blood drops that are on the card still left in your little monster area and take damage based on how many there are. Now, you again can use your equipment. Now, armor is usually what has these boots, helmet, and chest plate, and you spend focus or stamina to reduce the damage you took. If you go to zero health, though, you are knocked out of the game. And I'm guessing you don't get to respawn back at town on this one. 
No, but I will say it's not easy to die. You probably aren't going to die until the last fight. It's pretty easy to mitigate damage unless you play terribly. Like if you just, I'm going to grab all the monsters. Now I have seven monsters and I'm going to use my two dice to fight. Like, unless you, like, you got to play bad to, to, to fail that quickly in the game. So once you killed your monsters, you're going to get your rewards. Uh, besides having a shiny new piece of equipment for your character, each demon killed lets you level up your skills. And here's where the color coding goes in. If you kill a red monster, you get to level up your red skills. If you kill a green monster, you level up your green skills. Um, the way that works is you move gems up on the cards that represent your skills. And if ever the card has no gems on it, you get you earn that skill. This would make a lot more sense if you could see it. So I'm not going to get into more details here. Gems eventually will reach the top of the track. You then use those for equipping gear, which I'll get to in the next action. Equipping happens during resting. When you rest, the first thing you do is you get all your stamina and focus back. So you get your, your pools back. So they come off your equipment, and then you get to equip. Now, each piece of gear equipped does require you to spend gems that are unlocked while leveling up your skills. And again, you got that color thing going on. So green monsters drop green gear that require green gems to use. You can only equip one piece of gear in each of your seven slots. After equipping, any excess gear can be traded to the bank for potions. You get the pick your side this time. You don't flip them. Every character can hold four potions. Potions are used during a fight, but before you roll the dice to move focus and stamina back. So if you've got like your dagger and it's already filled up all the slots on it, you can spend a couple potions to free that up for the next fight. Now, can you hold on to extra excess gear to trade later if you're going to get more than the four potions you're allowed to hold? Yes, you can. You, your, your pack can hold any number of items in this game. So there's, that's, there's no that's way inventory. better than Diablo already. Then. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's a, no, I, I guess they assume you have a town portal and you go back to town and you leave piles all over the city because that's what I used to do. That's Diablo. Diablo 1, yeah. That's Diablo 1, yeah. See, I, I played a lot more Diablo 1 than 2. I did play 2. But yeah, you can hold on to it. One of the things players, it takes a bit to convince people to do is use your potions. Like, don't save them because you're going to get way more gear than you need, which is very much a Diablo aspect of this game. Yeah. Now, at the end of each action, you do this thing where you check to see if you unlock achievements. I don't know if there's achievements in Diablo, but it's very much a video game thing. Uh, you get these for being the first character to do something, whether it's unlock a certain number of gems, learn a certain number of skills, or equip a certain amount of gear. These are bonuses that you use during the final battle. So whoever can own more, more of these is going to have more of an advantage when you get to the final fight. The game continues like this until you get to the Gates of Sanctum, and then the game changes a bit. At this point, the only thing you can do now is fight and rest because there's no more movement. You've gotten to the end and you're going to keep going in turns until someone has defeated all the monsters on their board they've collected. At that point, the Demon Lord appears. At this point, the players have an option. They can, what they call, answer the call and they can give up the demons that are left on their board, ignore them and get ready to fight the main fighter. They can stay back to fight the monsters they still have. But every time they do that, more horrible things that ha will happen to them before the fight. And what these are is they call them the Demon Lord's Rage cards. And every player is going to face two of these. And then if anyone stayed back, they're going to face another one. And if anyone stayed back a third round, they're going to face another one of these. And these are horrible. Like they really are bad. They are terrible. They're like, do this horrible thing that ruins your character or spend one life. And that's and and every one of them's like that. It's like, all right, that one's okay, fine. I'll never get to use this dagger ever again. Okay, lose all your potions or lose one life. Like they're terrible. Right. So you better hope you got it right, folks, because it's gonna be a very bumpy ride once you get to that end. Yeah, because the one thing you've got at this point is you get one last chance to rest. So after this rage has gone off, after you've dealt with all the horribleness and possibly lost some health. You're done. You you rest once more and you rearrange your equipment. You don't get to do anything new. No new skills, no new equipment, nothing changes for the rest of the game at this point. Now, once we get to the actual final fight, this is played out uh, by each player individually, and you can actually do this simultaneously. You take your player board, you've wiped most of the stuff off it because all your skills and that don't matter anymore. You don't need your equipment. All that's gone. Well, your equipment you have, sorry, your, your, your pack full of stuff you've collected is gone. You set out five Demon Lord cards and four Fury cards. And it's like Demon Lord Fury, Demon Lord Fury. You then put your miniature on the first Demon Lord card and you start the fight. Now, these Demon Lord cards each show two dice on them. So they're just like the rest of the monsters. But you're fighting all of the face-up cards at once. So at this point, you are looking at five face-up cards, each of which require two dice and do two damage. So if you get past the first, if you don't get past the first one, if you don't get past the one, you're taking 10 damage right then and there. 
Now, after you defeat a Demon Lord card, you're going to flip those Fury cards. These, again, give you those hard choices again. The, like, lose a die for the rest of the fight or take a health. Never use your armor again or take a health. Like, and then they have more dice to defeat. So you got to defeat the Furies and defeat the Demon and then defeat another Fury, then defeat the Demon. And they do damage and money. The Furies do three. It's horrible. It's just terrible. And, and to make things even harder, during the first two rounds of this fight, you flip up two of those Demon Rage cards at the end of the round and more horrible things happen to you. And just as a heads up, watch that rule. We totally missed the fact that the Demon Rage happens between rounds. We just sat there and did our own little thing because they said you can play simultaneously. It's play out one round, Demon Roars, play out one round, Demon Roars. Okay, we don't have to worry about the roar again. Right. Now, the final battle, as you can tell, is just not easy. Like, like not once in any of the games I've played has every character made it to the end. Now, the winner, though, is the last person standing with the most health. And if that didn't happen, it's the one that got the furthest when battling the Demon Lord. All right, well, now we have a pretty good idea of how this game works. What did you actually think of it? All right, this is, I got to say, exactly what I expected from Check Games Edition. This is a game that takes what should be a pretty simple theme and turns it into a pretty heavy brain burning Euro. Like, I, I, I'm going to start calling this Dungeon Lords Effect because that was the first game I saw this with CGE. And, and like, Pulsar is another one. Well, Pulsar didn't look that late to start off. But, like, they, they seem to put out a lot of games. They're like, oh, uh, Adrenaline. Oh, it's a first-person shooter of the board game. Whoa, this is way more complicated than I thought it would be. This is not what I think people are going to expect, right? They're going to see this, and it's a dice Diablo game. It's probably, they're going to think it's like this, roll your dice, roll your dice, fighting waves and waves of baddies, this real-time game where you're going to get more stuff and flip over the baddies and collect your stuff and roll more dice, which actually kind of sounds kind of cool. I'd probably play that, but that's not what this is. This is a strategy based game with some tactics but really strategy heavy that's all about resource management and optimization like starting from the first turn of the game you're going to be looking at your skills and trying to decide what you want to unlock first and using that to figure out what monsters you want to take on and then making sure you draft the appropriate monsters for the skills you want but also remembering to take into consideration what types of gear you want to find because you don't want to necessarily take those monsters because you don't need two sets of boots on the first turn and every time i've taught sanctum it's had those eureka moments we've talked about before where, where you realize that like you, you could sit here. You could just be like, yeah, okay, I take those monsters and be like, oh, that one dropped the sword. Yeah, I should have realized that it has a sword on it. And you could do it and you could play through the game. You probably won't do that well. And to play well, every choice needs to be considered in relation to where you are at the time and where you plan to go. And there's those eureka moments of realizing that the oh wait the color of the monster matters that's a, that's a pretty one that usually happens pretty early oh the symbol on the monster matters oh wait these monsters all need threes having three monsters that need threes when i have gear that sets dice to four is probably not a good plan i should have drafted monsters that have fours on them because my dagger lets me set dice to four that it, those kind of eureka moments happen in this Yep. So you're not going to be having uh, multiple armor and weapon sets to swap out as needed, like in a video game here. Choices matter long term, especially when you get to that end game and you've got yeah. no more choices to make. You're stuck with the decisions that got you there. Yes, you are. Now, technically, you can swap out during a rest, but most of the time you're swapping good stuff for better stuff. Right. But I have seen it like if you find something better later, you can swap it out. There's not often I put on something that I got on the first board when I'm on the sixth board. Overall, I think the system is brilliant. Like that the, the combination of the monster colors, the colors of the skills, the different equipment types, be able to see what's coming. Like even the fact the monster deck is face up so you can see what you're going to spawn when you move, so you know exactly what's going to be up there. It is all really well balanced, and my, I, I am so glad that I didn't design this game. Like, I would hate to see the amount of playtesting that went into balancing this game. As for being a good board game representation of Diablo, I think Sanctum does a really good job of recreating parts of Diablo. Like what you're not going to find here is that dexterity element, the clicking element, the, the reactions, the real time, the stress of being swarmed by tons of enemies. That's not what this is. This is a deliberate thinky game that rewards planning and thinking things through over fast action. What I found did remind me the most about Diablo 
was trying to pick what the fight in hopes of getting the right thing. Like, oh, I really need a better weapon. So specifically picking enemies that drop weapons in order to find one. And then every rest phase made me think of Diablo because having to sit there and optimize my skill gems with my equipment to get the most out of it, like that right combination of gear, that felt very much like Diablo to me. Right. So grindy, but thinky grindy, as opposed to just wandering around a field until the right drop happens to occur. Yeah, there's no legendary items or any super rare items in the deck that you're trying to find either. Now, my one complaint I do have about this game is that paradigm shift between the main game and the boss battle. Because you spend the entire game gearing up for the main battle, but then the battle feels different somehow from the rest of the game. Like, in actuality, you're still doing the same thing. You're still rolling your dice to match the numbers on the cards to kill cards. But just you're not learning new stuff. You're no longer grabbing gear. You're not getting a reward for it. You're not building your character. It's just rolling a bunch of dice and using your existing stuff to the best of your ability. And, and like, that doesn't even sound that different. But trust me, when you play it, it just feels like a different part of the game. Yeah, I think the, the, real, the real sort of disconnect is it stops being a Euro um and, and just becomes a dice chucker at that point because you you've run out of options there are you don't have branches there aren't mm. choices that will affect things in any real way it's all about the dice and then whether or not you you know give up that armor or take a health point um yeah. which isn't the same as the, the 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 collection and the the seeking out of the of the different colored gems and and such along the way yeah, I can see that, definitely, especially as you get further along the fight, because eventually you'll have used up all your equipment. You'll have no stamina left, you'll have no focus left, and it gets down to just hoping you roll the right thing. Right. Overall, I, I dig it for what it is. I like Sanctum for what Sanctum is. Knowing it was a CGE game, I knew what to expect. I knew, knew that this was going to be a heavier, more Euro-style game. My biggest worry for this one is that people are going to pick it up expecting one thing and get another. They're going to expect a, a fast and furious uh, monster smashing game that is an aspect of Diablo and it's not. Now, I do think this is a very cool board game adaptation of games like Diablo. But if what you want is the hacking and slashing, you're not going to find it. Like, yes, you kill some demons, but it's all about spending dice. You're going to have a dice that, game that's mostly about planning ahead and randomness mitigation and having the tools to modify the dice and managing your resources while very deliberately planning your next move and advancement, uh, figuring out your advancement path and just all for one big fight, one big dice fest in the end and trying to get the most modifiers, the most bonuses, the most dice, the most extra stamina, the most potion, like just preparing for that fight. Due to this, I don't think this is for everyone in any way, shape, or form. Like, not even Diablo fans. Like, I, I'd love to be able to say, if you're a Diablo fan, pick up this. I don't think it's it, it's that kind of game. I do think it's a very solid game for people who like Dice Space Euros. And in that case, I don't think it matters if you know or care about Diablo at all. I think the mechanics stand on their own. So for a more in-depth look at Sanctum from CGE, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews.